Hey, it's Darius. And so much effort and energy go into each I-75 video. But you know what? It's all worth it. When the scores come out and you pass the CPA exam and you let me know that you noticed the I-75 difference. So congratulations to Jason for passing ISC. Did you fail the CPA ISC exam? If so, you probably need a little help on these five very important ISC topics. And we'll look at a multiple choice question from each of these topics in this video. Each multiple choice question that we're going to do in this video is right out of the I-75 ISC course. And there'll be a question on databases and SQL, cloud computing, regulatory frameworks, attacks and vulnerabilities, and SOC reporting, the big five when it comes to ISC. Let's start with a question on databases and SQL, because you know they're going to ask you about SQL on the exam. Which logical operator would be used in SQL to combine multiple conditions in a WHERE clause where all conditions must be true? Would that be AND, OR, NOT, or all of these? And the answer is A, AND. The AND logical operator is used in SQL to combine multiple conditions in a WHERE clause, and the AND requires that all the combined conditions be true for the row to be included in the query result. Here's an example. Select from employee table where department equals sales and salary is greater than 50,000. This particular query will return all employees who work in the sales department and have a salary greater than 50,000. Both conditions must be true for an employee to be included in the results. B is wrong. The OR operator is used to combine multiple conditions in a WHERE clause in that it requires only one of the conditions to be true for the row to be included in the query result. And C is wrong. The NOT operator is used to negate a condition, making the query select rows where the condition is false, not true. And this question wanted to know which logical operator would be used in SQL to combine multiple conditions in a WHERE clause where all conditions must be true. And we said the answer is AND. A is correct. Now let's look at a question on cloud computing. Leslie Corp wishes to develop software unique to their applications and needs as a manufacturer of musical equipment. They need access to operating system and developmental tools in a cloud-based environment. Leslie Corp would be looking to implement which of the following? Number one, platform as a service. Two, software as a service. Three, infrastructure as a service. And you would choose choice A if you thought they were looking to implement all three. Letter B, if you think they just want platform as a service and software as a service. Letter C, if they want software as a service and infrastructure as a service. And choose D, if you think all they're looking for is platform as a service. And D is correct. Since Leslie Corp needs access to operating systems and development tools for creating software, PAAS, platform as a service, that's the correct choice because it provides these tools as well as hosting capabilities. A is wrong. They're not looking for one, two, and three. While platform as a service provides a platform with tools for development, which Leslie Corp requires, including SAAS, software as a service, and IAAS in the answer, that's incorrect because software as a service delivers software over the internet, and that's not required for Leslie Corp's development of unique software. And IAAS provides fundamental computing infrastructure, which goes beyond the scope of what Leslie Corp needs. All they need is platform as a service. B is wrong because this incorrectly includes SAAS. And C is wrong, two and three. That's wrong because it leaves out what they really need, which is PAAS. So this question asked, Leslie Corp will be looking to implement which of the following. And because they want operating system and developmental tools, they're looking for platform as a service one only, letter D. And now let's look at a question from the I-75 ISC course on regulatory frameworks. All right, how about this? What is the main purpose of the regulatory framework known as PCI DSS? I'm sure you saw that on your ISC exam. Is it A, to ensure the security of health information? No, that's HIPAA. B, to enhance privacy protections for European Union citizens? No, that's the GDPR framework, isn't it? Is it C, to protect credit card data? Yes, that's PCI DSS. D, to set marketing communication standards? No. Letter C is correct. The main purpose of the regulatory framework known as PCI DSS is to protect credit card data. P 
PCI DSS stands for Payment Card Industry Data Security Standard. It's specifically designed to ensure that all companies that process, store, or transmit credit card information maintain a secure environment, thus protecting cardholder data against unauthorized access. A is wrong to ensure the security of health information. We said that's the HIPAA regulation, not PCI DSS. B is wrong to enhance privacy protections for European Union citizens. That describes the General Data Protection Regulation, GDPR. And D is wrong to set marketing communication standards. That's wrong because that's not the focus of PCI DSS. This question asked what's the main purpose of the regulatory framework known as PCI DSS. And the correct answer is C, to protect credit card data. So now we've looked at questions on databases and SQL, cloud computing, regulatory frameworks. Let's try a question on cyber attacks and vulnerabilities. All right, which of the following describes a vulnerability where two or more processes try to modify shared data simultaneously, leading to unpredictable results? Is that a buffer overflow, a race condition, a replay attack, or cross-site scripting? And the answer is B, a race condition. Because a race condition describes a vulnerability where two or more processes race in to try to modify shared data simultaneously. And that would lead to unpredictable results if they were both able to modify shared data at the same time. If the proper synchronization is not in place, the outcome can be rather unpredictable and lead to security issues. To avoid a race scenario, only one thread, one process can run inside the critical section the code segment that allows access to the shared variables. A is wrong, a buffer overflow occurs when a program writes more data to a block of memory or buffer than it is designed to hold. Since buffers are created to contain a finite amount of data, the extra information which has to go somewhere can overflow into adjacent buffers, corrupting or overwriting the valid data held in them. This can cause the program to crash produce incorrect results, or in the worst case, provide an attacker the opportunity to inject malicious code. C is wrong. A replay attack occurs when an unauthorized user eavesdrops on a secure network communication, intercepts it, and then sends the communication to its original destination without modification, as if she, the attacker, were the sender. To mitigate this, systems often use timestamps, unique sequence numbers, or one-time tokens that invalidate any transaction that is replayed. And D is wrong, cross-site scripting is a type of cyber attack that involves injecting malicious code into an otherwise trusted website. The goal of a cross-site scripting attack may be to redirect users to a phishing site. But this question didn't ask about that. The question asked which of the following describes a vulnerability where two or more processes try to modify shared data simultaneously, leading to unpredictable results and the answer is that describes a race condition. Choice B is correct. And now for a question on SOC reporting. For a real quick review of SOC reporting, I'm going to thank my I-75er, Jackie, who came up with this quick little helpful tool. SOC 1 deals with controls that would impact the client's financial data. A type 1 covers a point in time. Type 2 covers a period of time. SOC 2 deals with controls that would impact the client's non-financial data. And type one again would cover only a point in time. And type two would cover a period of time. So here's our question. What is the main difference between a SOC 1 type 1 report and a SOC 1 type 2 report? Letter A says the time period covered by the report. Could it be that easy? Let's see. B, the scope of the report. C, the intended audience of the report. D, the types of controls assessed. And the answer is A. The main difference between a SOC 1 Type 1 and a SOC 1 Type 2 is the time period covered by the report. SOC 1 Type 1 evaluates the suitability of the design of controls, but only at a specific point in time. It's a Type 1, so it only covers a specific point in time. While a SOC 1 Type 2 evaluates the operational effectiveness of those controls over a defined period of time, usually a minimum of six months. B is wrong, the scope of the report. Both reports can cover the same control objectives and areas. However, type one is a point in time, type two covers a period of time. C is wrong, the intended audience of the report, that's wrong. Both SOC 1 type one and type two 
they're intended for the same audience, the user entities and their auditors, especially when the service organization services are relevant to the user entities, internal controls over financial reporting. Remember, a SOC 1 deals with financial controls. And D is wrong, the type of controls assessed? No, both type 1 and type 2 reports assess the same types of controls. For a SOC 1, those are controls related to financial reporting. The distinction is not in the type of controls between type 1 and type 2. The distinction is in the period covered and also the manner of assessment. In a type 1, we're only looking at the suitability of the design of the controls. In a type 2, we're evaluating operational effectiveness. And when we evaluate suitability of design, we do it at a specific point in time. When we evaluate operational effectiveness of controls, we do it over a defined period, usually a minimum of six months. So this question asks, what is the main difference between a SOC 1 type 1 and a SOC 1 type 2? And the best answer is the time period covered by the report. Letter A is correct. So if you didn't pass the CPA ISC exam, maybe you got to brush up on one of these five big topics. Or maybe you found a different topic difficult while studying for ISC. If so, leave it for me in the comments section. And remember to like and subscribe because it really helps the channel out a lot. And if you need more help with ISC, go to i75cpareview.com and get yourself on I-75 with me, Darius Clark, because the right teacher makes all the difference. I'll leave a link in the description, but get on I-75 today and get home soon. For more help with the CPA ISC exam, go to i75cpareview.com, click on CPA Review, and then ISC. And that'll bring you here where you can choose the full I-75 ISC course, which is meant to be used as a standalone, no other materials needed, a monthly subscription that you can cancel anytime. You can even reach out to me and I will personally cancel the subscription for you when you're ready. Or you can choose the CRAM course. That's if you're testing within a week or two, then you choose the I-75 ISC CRAM. You get 15 days of access. It's a one-time payment. Either way, you get all the same videos, whether you choose the ISC Complete Course or the CRAM. All the videos are the same. The only difference is in the monthly subscription, you'll get the multiple choice tests that go along with each chapter. In the CRAM course, you'll get some multiple choice tests, but only as part of the final review. So if you're struggling to pass ISC, go to i75cpareview.com and get yourself on I-75 with me, Darius Clark, because the right teacher makes all the difference.